Friends, our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning with verse 11. And you will probably recognize this as the story of Elijah and God's still small voice. So uh, this is going to be projected on the screen, uh, but we also invite you to, um, to use the pew Bibles in front of you or your electronic uh, device to follow along. So hear the word of the Lord. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind was there, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, I don't know about you, but I love hearing stories of transformation. Stories of people who encounter God in dramatic ways, and it just changes the trajectory of their lives. Back in November of 2017, Kyra Langston, who is now our Minister of Children and Families and is here this morning, raise your hand, Kyra. I did get permission from Kyra to tell this story, but she came and she gave her testimony about how God had delivered her from a full-blown heroin addiction. She talked about how she was injured and started taking pain medication as prescribed by her doctor, how she got hooked and eventually, when she could no longer get those pills, turned to street heroin, hit bottom, and wound up in jail. She found Jesus through a women's ministry while in jail, which put her on the road to recovery and led her to dedicate her life at that time to helping other addicts as a drug and alcohol counselor. And that story is on our YouTube channel, if you didn't hear it. And it is one of the most powerful redemption stories that I've ever heard. And maybe you've heard stories like this too. You know, people go through a divorce and get stuck in anger and resentment, but then they go to something like a Christian concert and have a mountaintop experience. They find the courage to forgive their ex and start living a new freedom and joy, freedom from bitterness and anger. A young person hears God calling him to ministry, but feels unworthy and ill-suited, and so resists that call for years, even decades, but finally makes a decision to go to seminary and has a life-changing experience. But as heartwarming as these kind of stories are, they don't always connect with people. I recently had lunch with a friend who said to me, Mark, when you preach, you often tell dramatic conversion stories. And I sometimes feel left out because I never got hooked on drugs. I never went to jail. I never experienced the pain of a divorce. I never struggled with depression or found myself homeless. So when I think about the story of my life and how I decided to follow Jesus, it seems pretty boring. And when given the opportunity to share my story, I hesitate because I'm afraid that I will disappoint people. And this feeling can be exacerbated by the fact that when church people talk about the stories of the Bible, they often pick the ones that are filled with drama and excitement. And again, sometimes these stories don't connect with our ordinary lives. And if you are one of these people then I want to share some good news with you this morning. In the Bible, God is not only experienced in grand and dramatic events. In fact, most of the time, God is experienced in the mundane and the ordinary. And if you take notes, I would suggest that you write that down this morning because it is one of the main points of the message. God is most often experienced in the mundane in the ordinary, or as we read in 1 Kings 19 this morning, in a quiet whisper. Going back to our scripture reading, one gets a sense that Elijah had high expectations 
for encountering the presence of God. Mountains breaking, earthquakes shaking, and fires raging. I sound like a poet, don't I? I worked hard on that combination of words. I hope that you enjoyed it. And that's all pretty dramatic stuff, isn't it? But the Word of God didn't come through these dramatic events, but in a still, small voice. In a still, small voice. And that's pretty much the way that it has worked in my life, too. Growing up, I was a normal kid raised in the church. When I was about 12 years old, mom and dad took me to see the power team at the Lakeland Civic Center. Has anybody heard of the power team? If you haven't heard of this group, uh, they are a traveling group of Christian bodybuilders who went around in the 80s and performed acts of strength like tearing phone books in half and bending iron rods with their bare hands. And after capturing the people's attention, they would talk about the power of God to change our lives and then make an altar call. And after seeing the show around 12 and hearing their testimonies, I decided on my own to follow Jesus. And I woke up the next day and I was really excited to go to school with my new faith because I was a changed man. But if you've ever made a decision to follow Jesus, you know what happens next. The doubts began to creep in. And I began to wonder if I had really been changed. For the first time in my life, I began to see the extent of the hurts, habits, and hang-ups that made it difficult for me to follow Jesus in my everyday life. I knew deep in my heart that God loved me and wanted to be with me, but my desire, my desire to stay close to God and to follow Jesus proved to be fickle and half-hearted. Looking back, I had serious self-esteem issues, and for whatever reason, I just never felt good enough. I also felt alone and isolated because for me, following Jesus meant distancing myself from all of my non-Christian friends, which were the only friends I had, and going to church every time the doors opened. But eventually, the guilt and shame from what I perceived to be repeated moral failures, as well as the loneliness, became so overwhelming that I could not bear it, and it led me back to God, back to church, back to, in the language of my faith tradition, getting saved again. To varying degrees, I would repeat this cycle ad nauseum for 25 years. During this time, God spoke to me many times in subtle ways through countless people, various circumstances, books that I read. And, and this led to new insights, and it led to healing, and it, and it led to growth. But throughout those 25 years, I never really gave myself wholly to God in complete and total surrender. Ultimately, I wanted to maintain some vestige of control in my life along with the delusion that I could somehow, with enough willpower and intelligence, solve all of my own problems. That I could create the life that I wanted by using the gifts that God had given to me, but without asking for God's help. Of course, this never worked, and it always led me back to God. In retrospect, what I really wanted from God was something dramatic, something spe spectacular and miraculous. I wanted a divine magic trick that would fix me. After trying to run my own life and experiencing acute pain, I would tap out as if I were in a jujitsu match. I would submit to God and I would pray for God to change me but to change me right now so that I could escape the struggle and I could escape the pain. I did not want a long, hard, messy, and mundane process of healing. I wanted a quick, clean, easy, and dramatic miracle. And when that didn't happen, fear would cause me to quickly take matters back into my own hands and get back on that wheel of self-destructive behavior. You might find this surprising, 
But it wasn't until I was serving my second church that I came to accept that following Jesus is not a quick fix, but a lifelong journey full of ups and downs, successes and failures, victories and struggles. And once I accepted this, I also had to accept that I could not navigate this long, hard, messy process without help from God. And not periodic help, not help once a week or once a month, but help every single day. The kind of help that's made available through spiritual practices. The difference is that these spiritual practices, which I grew up learning as spiritual disciplines, they were no longer obligations imposed upon me by people in authority. But for the first time, they became ways to connect with the presence of God so that I could receive what I needed to heal and grow, both spiritually and emotionally, and to experience abundant life. And much to my chagrin, <laughs> all of this did not come through divine magic tricks and dramatic events, but through very ordinary, mundane things. And I share this part of my story to emphasize the main point, that when God speaks to us, it usually happens through the ordinary. When God speaks to us and heals us and guides us and empowers us and changes us, it's usually something that happens through mundane and ordinary things, ordinary times, ordinary places, ordinary people, ordinary things. And it's not just my life that bears testimony to this truth. We also see it writ large in Scripture. Now, while we celebrate the good news that God uses uneventful times nondescript places and ordinary ways to connect with us, it is also true that God does not force his love upon us. We must want it. We must seek it. And as is the case in my story, it often takes a long time to develop enough desire to truly surrender to God and seek God daily. Nevertheless, somebody say nevertheless, that's a great word that describes grace, my friends. Nevertheless, God makes a way. Even before we're ready, God makes a way. God makes himself available to us for deep, authentic relationship every moment of every day. And whether we seek that presence or not, to awaken to that presence, to live in that presence, is a decision that we have to make. We get to choose how much of God we want. Are you awake, church? We get to choose how much of God we want. And this is the second main point of the message this morning. People who passionately desire to experience the presence of God in their daily lives develop habits that awaken and open them to the presence of God, that put them in the flow of God's transforming grace. And they develop these habits by committing to a series of spiritual practices every single day. Ordinary practices that are already integrated into our daily lives. They involve things like reading, reflecting, writing, singing, talking, and sharing, developing friendships, and helping others. Again, these are already things that we do throughout the day, whether we are Christians or not. But when these ordinary things are directed toward God in hopes of connecting with God, they are transformed in the power of the Holy Spirit into what we call means of grace or channels of blessing. Take the ordinary practice of reading. Friends, we read things all day long. Think about all the things that you read. We read books and menus 
Menus can be particularly challenging for me now that I'm pushing 50, and if I forget my reading glasses, my family laughs at me as I open the camera on my phone and zoom in so that I can read what's in front of me. But we read books and menus. We read street signs and social media posts, magazines and recipes when we're cooking dinner. But when we direct this reading toward the Bible, for example, and read prayerfully with the intention of hearing from God or encountering God's presence, this reading becomes a spiritual practice that in the power of the Holy Spirit can function as a means of grace, a way of connecting with God. Or take the ordinary practice of conversation. Think about how many conversations you have every day. We talk to all kinds of people, don't we? Spouses and children colleagues and supervisors, people that we like and people that we don't like, cashiers and clerks. But when we direct our conversation to God with the intention of talking to and listening to God, our conversation becomes prayer and prayer is a means of grace. Or when we direct that conversation toward other Christians with the intention of discerning God's will and doing God's will, it becomes a spiritual practice, a means of grace, whether it takes the form of Christian counseling, spiritual direction, or just a meaningful conversation with a trusted friend. God can work through that to connect with us. Or take the ordinary practice of singing. Most of us listen to music, and a lot of us sing along with music, even if we're not very good singers. Have you had this ex experience before? <laughs> we listen to and sing rock and rap, pop and Christian, reggae, if you live in Cocoa Beach, and country, if you're my wife, <laughs> classical and crooner. But when we direct that singing to God with the intention of praising God and gaining encouragement to follow Jesus, singing becomes a spiritual practice, a means of grace. And when we put all of this together, this praying and singing and, and, uh, and reading, we put all this together, we get worship, which is another spiritual practice, another means of grace, which is not limited to corporate gatherings on Sunday morning once a week, but is something available to us as a practice all day, every day. Or take the ordinary practice of giving. We give to people all the time. Pay attention to how often you share or give to others. Whether it's giving change to the man holding a sign at the corner of A1A in Pinita, donating food to a local pantry, or writing a check to your alma mater, or filling out a pledge card for the United Way. We give throughout the year, and it feels good, doesn't it, to help others. But when we acknowledge that God is the giver of all good gifts, and we give for the purpose of advancing the mission of Jesus and bearing testimony to the generosity of God, guess what happens in the power of the Holy Spirit? Our giving becomes a spiritual practice, a means of grace. Again, the goal of these kinds of practices is to help us to develop an awareness of God all around us in every moment of our lives which allows us to get in touch with the will of God and to find what we need to carry it out. Like Elijah, we find God speaking in the still small voice that whispers to us amidst our ordinary daily routines. And this means, my friends, that we can have as much of God as we want if we are willing to seek it. So what about you? How much of God do you want? How much healing do you want? How much peace, love, and joy? How much guidance, wisdom, and empowerment? How much growth? And how much of yourself are you willing to give to God day in and day out, to receive these graces. If you have a desire to have more of God in your ordinary daily routines, the first step may be to ponder what it would be like and how your life would change 
if you committed to one of these practices for a short period of time. And the second step, after you kind of get an image in your mind of what might it be like, what might happen to my life if I just picked up one of these spiritual practices and tried to stay awake to the presence of God, once you get that vision, the second step is to try it out for a little while, maybe every day for four weeks to try to train a new habit. And as you do this, it may be helpful to seek some guidance from a mature Christian friend. I wonder who in your life can help you and support you to do this. It might be helpful to consider how other people have managed to integrate things like prayer and Bible study worship and generosity into their everyday lives. You may consider what kinds of resources are available to help. Things like books and apps on your phone, classes at the church. I am convinced, my friends, that the more of these practices you are willing to do, and the the more often that you do them, the more you will find yourself in the flow of God's grace. See, God's grace is already flowing. It's always flowing. We just become blind, deaf, and dumb to it, right? But when we awaken to the presence of God and allow ourselves to be integrated into the flow of God's grace and we're cooperating with God's grace through these spiritual disciplines, what happens? Well, the more you will change and become like Jesus, which is the ultimate goal. And the more that you change and become like Jesus, the more time that you're going to want to spend with God and the more time you're going to want to spend in these practices so that it's no longer an obligation, right? I always tell people when I teach the spiritual practices, there's no devotional police that's going to come around and write you a ticket if you don't do your, you know, check off the box on your one-year reading plan, right? It's not an obligation that we hold to with some kind of legalistic mentality. These are gifts of God, They are practices in which God makes himself available to you and says, here I am, arms wide open. Come, spend some time with me. Let me embrace you. Let me heal you. Let me guide you. Let me empower you. Let me give you the life that Jesus lived and died for, abundant life. Friends, make no mistake. God wants all of you all the time and makes himself available every moment of every day. The question is, and always will be, how much of God do you want?